Now this is a really special place. It's the hall of the Tallow Chandler's Livery Company in the City of London. Now this whole area was destroyed by the Great Fire in 1666 and they rebuilt this hall in the 1670s. It's a fascinating period. Charles II was on the throne. Christopher Wren was rebuilding St Paul's just over there. It's an age of the great diarists Samuel Pepys and John Evelyn, the scientist Isaac Newton, the philosopher John Locke. And I'm here to meet Dr Hannah Dawson, who has a thrillingly unique vision of this period in our history. Hannah, just coming here makes me want to write about the 17th century. You've got this <laughs> wonderful, clear, beautifully designed courtyard and the chaos of the city just a hundred yards out there. And for me, it's this extraordinary period of contrast to the 17th century between darkness and light, between chaos and order. What is it about the period that really fascinated you? Well, actually, it is far more the chaos than it is the light um, that you're referring to. And in fact, I think that the entire concept of the Enlightenment um, is in a way a spectacular misnomer. So um, while it's known as the great age of reason and secularism, in fact I think that the great thinkers of the Enlightenment were obsessed with the power of passion and sentiment and custom. And if you think about history as a discipline when you can study anything you want, why, why did you wake up one morning and say actually I want to study the history of ideas, I want to be able to explain these changes in thought? What really got me in history and then in the history of ideas was when I read Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan as an undergraduate. And there um, I was, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, confronted for the first time with fundamental questions that I just really hadn't asked myself about why, why it was, for example, that I obeyed the law. You know, how, what a weird thing it is. We, for the, none of us, for the most part, particularly like the government. We don't like being told what to do by anyone. And yet, um, we do. Why do we do that? And um, Hobbes gives us this extraordinarily kind of compelling answer that I think still holds the court now, which is that we do it because it's in our interests to do so. One of the things I really like about studying history is being able to immerse yourself in essentially a completely alien time and space where a lot is very difficult to understand and some of it's frankly mad <laughs> but, but, but some of the ideas and the way they think and behave also has quite a lot going for it. Yes, yes, I think that's right and I think that one has to be really cautious about talking about the madness of the past because of, all, of course they had very good intricate reasons for thinking and believing certain things. Um, so for example something that struck me recently in thinking about the work of the terrible Thomas Hobbes, the mad Thomas Hobbes, is that we now, for example, take it for granted in the West that the most important thing about politics is that we should live in a democracy. And what Hobbes kind of counters, if you like, what Hobbes brings to the table is he says actually the most important thing is that we should live under government per se, regardless of how imperfect that government is, because that living under government is better than the war which will ensue if you stage a revolution, if you get rid of your government. Um, and so that kind of fundamental change of focus from the form of government, that's to say democracy, to government per se, and that that is the crucial thing, that's the thing that enables us to walk about the streets mm. You know, um, happy that we're not going to be attacked by somebody else because those other people are terrified of what the government is going to do to them if they break the law. That's actually the kind of crucial point about our, um, about our political life. That's the thing that we need. That's the thing that's going to keep us safe. And so from your perspective, if you're identifying a particular issue like that yes. and you say I want to take this forward I want to research into it how do you how do you go about doing that there's, there's been a sort of revolution if you like in the history of ideas in the last kind of 40 or um, so years which has been to say that what we mustn't do is to think of the history of ideas as made up of a series of canonical great texts that if you like answer perennial questions through time that instead the way that we're to understand texts is to understand them as particular contingent interventions in debates of particular times that have particular political 
or social purposes. So the only way you can understand them is to read massively around exactly. the period in which that text was written. So you can't understand Hobbes unless you understand the 17th century. The simple idea of fitting, fitting a man and his idea into his time and actually that's being right. aware of his contemporaries. That's right. And I think that's one of the, the wonderful things about history is that once you realise, you, you open a tiny door yes. into a particular thing, you realise that it makes completely no sense yes. unless you can actually that's understand right. where you are and what's going on. That's right. That's, I think that's really crucial. Um, and, and so, for example, you know, um, Thomas Hobbes hated for saying that you must not, under any circumstances, stage a revolution. Mm -hmm. Do not think about standing up for your rights, because what you um, face to lose is far more important than that. That's to say, you'll probably lose your life if you start to stand up for your rights. And we now obviously find that sort of abhorrent. We think it's, it's appalling the way that people are oppressed. And of course, and I think that too, but nonetheless, um, what we have to understand is that Hobbes was writing at the time of the English Civil War. So he knew firsthand the peculiar horror of what it meant for brother to be divided against brother, for brother to kill brother. And it was in the context of that, in the context of that bloodbath, that he saw the peculiar virtue and good of peace. I think this question of revolutions is actually particularly interesting and relevant to ideas because as a historian, I tend to study events. Yes. But what's brilliant about ideas is that often they're the forerunner of events, aren't they? And yeah. so you can almost, if you're studying the history of ideas, you can study history almost before it happens. You can get a sense of a kind of the first shock wave of something really significant happening. I know you're working on Hobbes at the moment. Is there a particular subject that you're tackling? One of the um, things that Hobbes is known for is, um, is the social contract, that he, in a way, um, gave the first clear formulation of the idea that there's a contract between the people and the government. Um, and people have found this idea very sort of mystifying because it seems that actually we don't, we don't kind of choose to live under government. We're born under government. Um, and Hobbes's point, which I think is really um, sort of deep in a way, is that, um, is that, well, first of all, you can leave. I mean, if you, if, you know, if you don't want to live under this government, you can leave. But his point is that by enjoying the fruits of government, by walking about the streets, by enjoying the peace that it affords us, by enjoying the rule of law, you are benefiting from the fruits of government and you are thereby tacitly consenting to the costs with, that come with that. You've made a contract that says that you will give up, you're willing to give up your liberty in exchange for security. That's the Hobbesian social contract. And that, of course, has now become the mantra, if you like, of Western governments. You know, Tony Blair said it, David Cameron's saying it, uh, Obama's saying it. This fundamental idea that Hobbes, I think, formulated really clearly for the first time that we don't want complete liberty. Complete liberty is dangerous. Complete liberty means that I have the freedom to attack you and you have the freedom to attack me and we'll both end up dead. Or we'll both end up certainly in a state of deep timidity and won't be able to get on with living our lives and fulfilling our dreams. And so it's good. It's good to give up some liberty in exchange for security. So, Hannah, are there other people working in this field? Or are you just doing it all by yourself, trying to come up with these ideas? <laughs> well, strange as it may seem, there are hordes of us engaged, not only in the history of political thought, which sort of clearly kind of might have some sort of relevance or interest, and you might think that people are doing that, but there are also a large number of people working more broadly on intellectual history, thinking about what people thought in the past about language, as I have done, or nature, or bees. So I've got a good bee fact. Have you? <laughs> in the 1650s, uh, most beehives were made out of straw, and there were three glass beehives in England. There were just three, and John Evelyn had one of them in his garden at Say's Court, just across the road at Deptford. And it was so interesting that the king came to John Evelyn's house to have a look at his glass beehive. So it was the first time that anyone had ever been able to see bees at work. They had no idea what happened. They thought that honey came from the air. Wow. Well, I'm delighted that they found out about bees, but I nonetheless wouldn't like myself to fall into a glass beehive. No, definitely. <laughs>